Welcome to our first Virtual Insights. I'm Andrea Davidson, the Vice President of Philanthropy at San Bernardino Prebis Medical Discovery Institute. As many of you know, we host a special series called Insights, where our scientists share their perspectives on important health topics such as Alzheimer's disease, cancer, and many other conditions that affect our lives. But today we are here to talk about COVID-19, and of course, doing this virtually. I'm so pleased to be here with two of our leading scientists, Dr. Sumit Shanda and Dr. Evan Snyder. Sumit is the director of the Immunity and Pathogenesis Program. He is a Stanford-trained scientist who previously worked at the pharmaceutical company Novartis before joining our institute in 2007. He is a renowned virologist and has spent many years developing innovative approaches to treat viruses such as HIV, Ebola, dengue fever, and respiratory virus, including MERS, SARS, influenza, and now the current coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Sumit, thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure to join you. Evan is the director of the Center for Stem Cells and Regenerative Medicine at our institute. He began his career as a physician scientist at Harvard University and Boston Children's Hospital. Today, Evan practices neonatology and neurology at UC San Diego, while simultaneously doing groundbreaking stem cell research at our institute. Evan has served two terms as chairman of the FDA Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee and has been elected to the very prestigious Association of American Physicians. Evan, thank you also for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So again, I wanna thank Sumit and Evan for taking the time out of their very busy, busy schedules to participate in this event. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So for both of you, what did each of you think when you learned the coronavirus was officially declared a pandemic? And I'll and let you know, first. <laughs> yeah, okay, I was gonna say, I'll go, I'll go ahead and go first. So, um, you know, for us, it wasn't a, a terrible surprise. Uh, we have been tracking this virus uh, from the outbreaks in Wuhan. Uh, most virologists will tell you that uh, if you see the uh, spread of a coronavirus or an influenza virus, uh, these are viruses with very high pandemic potential. Um, so, uh, you know, the uh, WHO, WHO, declaring it officially a pandemic uh, was a little bit of an afterthought for us. Uh, they had gone through uh, different phases of elevating it. And so the last phase met a specific criteria, but in, in reality, uh, this was a global threat well before uh, the WHO gave it an official designation. Good, and, and you, Evan? Well, What did you think when you learned this was officially declared a pandemic? Well, my first response, um, as you know, I'm a clinician. In fact, I'm a newborn intensivist, a neonatologist. So my first response was, I need to get in there and I need to help my colleagues right on the front line, taking care of patients, they're being overwhelmed. And that was my first instinct. And then of course I realized that probably the last person they want taking care of 60 year olds is a neonatologist used to running ventilators on newborns. But I realized that as a stem cell biologist, I thought that we really could make an impact. Now, some people might say, well, this is just a stem cell biologist falling into this, uh, this dictum that, well, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But quite frankly, we in stem cell biology are used to modeling diseases in a dish. And there was so much that was unknown about this virus, uh, even the cells that, in, that it affected. And quite frankly, we had been watching Sumit's heroic efforts on screening 12,000 FDA approved drugs that would seem to have an impact in blocking uh, the virus's cytopathic effects but in cells that were not entirely representative of what was going on. On the other hand, we could make many lungs in a dish. Now, I'll take a minute to explain what that is. The most important thing before I actually talk about the science is 
highlighting Sandra Leibel. She is a fellow neonatologist in my lab and was interested in studying lung disease in babies. And in the course of doing that in our group, along with some very talented te uh, technicians and graduate students in the group, came up with what you are seeing on the left. That is a mini lung in the dish. And you would say, well, that doesn't really look like a lung, but you know, it actually functions and does look like a lung. This is what most people think of when they think about a lung, but the lung is made up of many different cell types and they all develop in utero. Sounds like I'm being called to go to the NICU. <laughs> <laughs> they develop in utero all the various cell types that you can see. Now, what stem cell biologists do is emulate the development of the lung. They start at the earliest, earliest stages and watch the development until you get all the cell types. Well, once you've recreated that in a dish, you do have a complete lung that, if you've done it right, actually, as you can see in this movie, emulates not only all the cell types that potentially the virus could hit, but even the respiratory movements of the lung. So literally a mini lung in the dish. And we were in a unique possibility. And I can say, unlike anybody else in the world, we have the only authentic mini lungs in a dish in the literature could start infecting them, seeing what are the cell types that are infected, what does the virus do once it's made this connection, and then which of Sumit's drugs could be most useful to fast track into clinical trials to take care of patients and try to work out the mechanism, try to work out the dosing, and as maybe we'll talk about later, even make sure that these drugs are effective against all potential patients that could be uh, afflicted with this viral infection. Thank you, Evan. That's also a, a nice transition into um, our, our, our next question and topic. Where, where are we today with the pandemic? And Sumit, I'll have you go ahead and lead off. Yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, a, a good news uh, story uh, mixed in with a, a whole lot of trepidation and uh, unknown. So the good news is that the development of a vaccine is really off to the races right now. Uh, a number of uh, companies and uh, institutes around the world have initiated uh, early phase human testing. Um, if uh, we're able to get a vaccine rolled out in the next year to a year and a half, um, then I think you know, that's when we start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I think social distancing measures in the U.S. and around the world have had its effect uh, of flattening the curve. Uh, so this is kind of the mantra that you've been he hearing. And what that has enabled us to do is not overwhelm our medical system so that people are dying because they cannot get treated. So at this point, if you show up with COVID-19 or, or other diseases, there is room at hospitals in California to be able to take you in and treat you. The last piece of good news is the development of, on the antiviral front. So remdesivir, uh, uh, an antiviral drug that was originally used for Ebola, uh, has been now clinically evaluated and shown efficacy in the treatment of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Now, this is not going to be a cure, it's a treatment. Uh, it will help some people, but not everybody. That's why uh, we and others are working, uh, continue to work day and night in search of a, additional antivirals and, and, and other drugs that can help tra uh, treat the disease uh, to turn this into something that uh, gets people sick, but are, we're not seeing the kinds of death rates that, uh, that we're seeing now. But I also want to caution your audience. Um, this virus is not going away until uh, the, the vaccine, if and when it gets developed. So we have to adjust to a new normal. And some of that new normal 
is uh, inconvenience, wearing face masks, not going to concerts or baseball games. Uh, but some of these uh, uh, new normals are quite dire. And uh, so they're predicting that given current uh, reopening schedules, uh, we should be expecting in June about 3,000 Americans a day uh, to, to perish from COVID-19. Now, if you think about that, that is a 9-11 type event every day for the foreseeable future. Now, six months ago, uh, that would just seem horrific, right? But as of right now, I think uh, people are adjusting uh, for their expectations uh, to really try to absorb this kind of, of, of suffering. Uh, so uh, these are things that we're gonna have to deal with. Uh, we have to balance our, the, reco uh, the reopening of the economy with, with uh, 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 people's health and people's lives going forward. And we should be following the guidance of uh, uh, health professionals. Uh, the second thing I think uh, uh, your audience should be made aware of is that we could go into a slow burn. Uh, this could go away in the summer if this is a seasonal virus. Uh, if it does, uh, I think most people would expect this to uh, uh, have a resurgence in the fall. The 1918 uh, influenza pandemic uh, we can take some lessons from that uh, that event that happened 100 years ago. Uh, on the left side of the slide is a graph showing the impact of the 1918 influenza pandemic on life expectancy in the U.S. You can see as comparison to World War I and World War II, uh, the flu did a lot more to impact uh, life expectancy in the U.S. Uh, with about 500,000 deaths, uh, which was a much greater portion of the, the population. But the other thing I want to point out is that the 1918 pandemic wasn't just a single pandemic. It was actually three different waves of pandemics. And we, if, in, if we were to draw a parallel, uh, we had the first wave uh, this spring uh, and late winter. Uh, and again, uh, flu is not in, uh, influenza is not coronavirus, but uh, both can be seasonal. And uh, it, we should be prepared for a potentially more devastating uh, second wave uh, in, in October. And we need to have in place proper surveillance, proper medical support, uh, and, uh, and hopefully proper treatments uh, that can uh, really mitigate some of the damage that a second wave might, uh, might produce. Good. Uh, Evan, any thoughts? Um. Well, I, I think that there is a lot that is not known about the virus. And my feeling is that what we see in patients is not simply that a virus hits a particular cell. What we see is a whole cascade of events um, that certainly the virus kills certain cells, but then that alone causes a huge inflammatory reaction. It makes blood vessels leaky. The toxins can leak out and affect the heart. So what we're dealing with um, is, is a, a series of pathophysiologic events. And if we're going to have to treat this disease, it's probably gonna be a cocktail of drugs certain drugs that hit the virus at various points in its life cycle, something that will inhibit its binding, some, a drug that will prevent its replication, another drug that maybe prevents the spread from cell to cell, another drug that inhibits the inflammatory reaction, another drug that maybe allows the surfactant, this material in the lung that allows the alveoli to open and close. So I think just as we treat AIDS now, HIV infection with a cocktail, um, we're gonna need a cocktail here as well. And I'd like to think that we stem cell biologists can contribute to that because the very art of being a stem cell biologist, particularly using these three dimensional organoids is it's filled with multiple cell types. And what I'm hoping we'll be able to contribute to 
the efforts that Sumit and his colleagues are doing is saying, um, this is where this drug works and that blocks binding. This is where this drug works. This is actually inhibiting inflammation. Now, fortunately, the very uh, goal of having a mini lung in the dish is it's not just the, the respiratory cells. We also have in there the cells that mediate inflammation, macrophages. We also have blood vessels in there. And what I'm hoping we'll be able to do is help Sumit and his colleagues come up with exactly the right cocktail to be able to, to deal with this kind of thing. If we're really lucky, and because what Sumit has done is get the best of the drugs that are already FDA approved. They've already been in animals. We already know what their biodistribution is, what their side effects is, what their safe dosing should be, that if we do our job right, we may be able, in, in some cases, to actually leapfrog over some of the animal studies that have already been done and fast track that into patients. Perfect, perfect, thank you, Evan. So both of you have uh, alluded to a little bit in regard to my next question about uh, what is currently being done by scientists and doctors uh, to address this pandemic. Um, is, there, is there anything else you'd like to add as to what uh, we're doing globally to address this, scientists and doctors? Yeah, Andrea, you know, we obviously uh, uh, antivirals and, and vaccines are, 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 are the first uh, line of business uh, in order to combat this virus. But uh, I, I just want to uh, echo uh, Ev Evan's uh, optimism about his model, uh, because it's going to be an incredibly powerful tool, not only for us to uh, identify drugs that are most likely to work in humans, I think it's also going to be something that allows us to understand how the virus interacts with our cells and what that it does to our cells. We don't know anything about this virus, right? No one had heard of this virus before January. So uh, without that basic understanding, right, without that basic knowledge, uh, it's going to be uh, almost like shooting in the dark and trying to come up with the right therapies. And so, yes, uh, I think Evan's uh, uh, models are gonna help us pick the best drugs, but I also think Evan's models are going to help us understand the virus in a way that we couldn't do that, uh, do in, in, in using uh, current technologies that are, 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 are very simplistic and simplified in the way uh, we model uh, how a virus replicates in the cell. Um, and Sumit, do you want to expand a little bit more on on what you're specifically doing that's that's yeah. moving kind of these shots on target forward? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, so back in January, uh, when we first heard uh, of this uh, uh, pneumonia of unexplained origins uh, uh, that was uh, setting in on, on Wuhan, and and and, and soon after. Uh, was was uh, characterized because by a novel coronavirus, uh, our immediate inclination uh, was to find antiviral therapies. Now, uh, the drug discovery process, uh, if you start from scratch, uh, takes about 10 to 17 years. So obviously, uh, this was not a path that we could pursue to try to bring uh, immediate relief uh, to uh, what was at that time, uh, patients limited in, to, to, to the Ube province in, in China. And so the strategy we chose to take was uh, team up with uh, uh, some from friends and colleagues at, at Caliber, which is the drug discovery arm of Scripps right here across the street. So they had built uh, an FDA approved library um, that, that uh, uh, Evan was mentioning. So these are about 13,000 drugs that have either uh, been approved by the FDA or have been in clinical trials. So they've been in humans before, and so we know how safe they are, okay? So our goal was, can we teach old dogs new tricks? Can we take old drugs and see if we can retrain them to work against coronavirus? So what we did was employ 
what's called a high throughput strategy. So this essentially means it's an approach to really multiplex uh, biology. So typically labs will test one, two, three, maybe five things at a time. We need to come up with a way to quickly test 13,000 things at a time. And these assays really, you know, you mix live virus with live cells and you look at live replication events, which means how well the virus copies itself uh, in, in those cells when, so during infection. And so to uh, add uh, to the challenge here, uh, the original goal was to uh, send a postdoc out into Hong Kong who had the virus at the time and, and no one here uh, had access to the virus. Unfortunately, there was the, the travel shutdown and so all of this was done remotely by iPhone. So our postdocs would get off, our scientists would get up at two in the morning, get on their iPhones. We had shipped them some of our automation, some of our machines, uh, this drug library, and would essentially talk them through uh, how to do this type of uh, analysis and assays uh, from 7,000 miles away. So. You know, when Evan says heroic, it wasn't heroic on my part. It was heroic on the folks who were actually doing those experiments. I never knew you could do drug discovery by iPhone, but, you know, I guess there's an app for that now. <laughs> Technology you can do almost anything yep. by iPhone. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, Evan, so you you talked a little bit about how uh, your your research kind of parallels with what Sumit is doing, um, but what what is the significance of your research with with those that already have uh, the COVID virus? I mean, how is this going to help? How is this going to help them if you can block inflammation? Right. Um, very fortunately. Um, the, the, the many lungs that we had, as I think I mentioned before, not only have the lung cell types, but also have the other cell types that constitute a real human lung. And uh, we've made sure that the many lungs can also have cell types called macrophages. These are the mediators of inflammation, which some people believe really is what is killing the patients. They also have blood vessels in them. Uh, and many people believe that it's the leakiness of the blood vessels in the lung that is also contributing to the pathology in the patients. And also very, very interestingly, and this gets back to what we as neonatologists do all the time, these organoids have cell types called type 2 alveolar cells. Now, we as neonatologists know this because these are the cell types that make a, a kind of a molecule called surfactant. Surfactant is what makes uh, the air sacs very, very flexible. A neonatologist knows about this because they don't develop until 34 weeks of age and we deal with lots of babies that are born before 34 weeks gestation and age, and we have figured out how to either replace surfactant or watch the development of these kind of cell types. Um, what many of the patients with COVID-19 are dying from is something called adult respiratory distress syndrome. It's what we all the time see as neonatologists, but now happening, happening in an adult. Now it's either because the virus is directly attacking those cells that make it, or the stress of the environment or the inflammation is just using up all of the surfactant. Either way, one, we can answer that question of what's going on, and two, screen for drugs that particularly are addressing this surfactant deficiency, either drugs that can prevent it from being used up or that can stimulate its production or that can protect uh, the alveolar cells. So I think that 
particularly focusing on drugs that are downstream of the viral infection. Certainly, we're going to look at how we can block what the virus does directly on the cells. But to answer your question, what can we do for those that have already been infected with the virus? Well, we can find the right anti-inflammatory drug because we have macrophages there. We can look at what is going on with the blood vessels. Maybe we can stabilize them. There's also a thinking that a lot of what is going on is that the coagulation pathway is put into hyperdrive. We're getting blood clots where we shouldn't. I think we may be able to start address that because we have blood vessels in there. And then finally, we can try to figure out, after the virus has attacked these various lung cells, can we figure out how to reverse that process, how to protect these lung cells? And again, what many people think stem cell biologists do is trigger repair, trigger regeneration. Well, we can look at that. That, that actually is right in our sweet spot. Right. Good. Yeah, Andrew, I just want to... Andrea, I just want to echo yep, ahead, uh, Evan's, Evan's comments, right? I, I think that, uh, you know, there's two things that send you to the hospital, right? It's the virus and it's your body's response to the virus. And most people who get the virus don't end up in the hospital, okay? The people who end up in the hospital, who end up in the ICU, have this overdrive response to the virus. And whether it be inflammation, whether it be coagulation or a number of different processes that uh, the body uh, overreacts to the virus. Those are the kinds of things that are, we're going to have to learn about and learn to control. And and I think that those are going to be complementary pieces in developing a cure uh, instead of these uh, treatments that are are coming online right now. Good. Well, and that that leads me into the the next topic of discussion um, because we know that this is not over. So what about future pandemics? What do we need to do to prepare? Yeah, I, I, you know, I hope if there's one thing uh, good that comes out of this pandemic is that we don't forget about uh, the threat of global pandemics. So uh, if you think back 30 years, these pandemic type events were fewer and further between. But if you just think back in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, we had SARS, we had swine flu, we had Zika, we had Ebola, uh, and now we have SARS-CoV-2. So these are coming on uh, almost the heels of one another, right? So um, the the key here now is to be prepared, right? Have surveillance, have diagnostics at the ready. Instead of starting from scratch, have these in place. Preposition uh, antiviral therapies. Right there, there is a class of antiviral th therapies called broad spectrum therapies, just like you have for bacteria, uh, but they have not been developed because there didn't seem that there was going to be a, a, an overt need for them. Can we preposition vaccines? So, for example, uh, people had been working on uh, a vaccine for the original SARS in 2002, 2003, although uh, the funding on that dried up. Now, you can argue that, boy, if we had finished that program, a vaccine for the current SARS could be just as easy as swapping out something like we do for flu and get a new vaccine every year. So there are viruses that we know are classified as having high pandemic potential. We know what they are. This coronavirus, uh, uh, virologists knew that these were viruses with high pandemic potential we should have been pre-positioning vaccines and, and antivirals ahead of time. Now, uh, it's, it's always hard to, to try to anticipate things, but you know, I would argue that, look, a $40 million investment back in 2008 on a SARS-1 uh, um, vaccine now seems like a fantastic bargain <laughs> compared right. to the uh, the impact that is having. So yes, this may never happen, but there is a finite possibility that it can. And at this point, I hope that if anything good comes out of it, this serves as a clarion call for the world to be ready for these pandemics, not reactive to them like we have now, but be proactive, preposition 
uh, resources, pre-visits and surveillance, share information, have networks of scientists and clinicians at the ready and ready to spring into action uh, when the next virus jumps species and looks like it may go global. Yeah. And, and just a quick follow-up question from that. Um, I know we're just now starting to see some effects from those that have had the virus. And what, what do you suspect some of the long-term problems could be for those that have had the virus and now um, may have some, some issues that may relate back to it? Evan, why don't you go ahead and take that one since you're the clinician here. You know, I think that um, the virus does affect cells, and we're starting to learn that it affects more than just lung cells. Uh, and the price that one pays, and we know this from other viral infections, that particularly in organs that don't regenerate, that there may be some residual deficits. But even in the lung, which is a very regenerative organ, the results of inflammation can be very long-standing. So it's too early yet to see what the effects are. But my concern would be that somebody who has been for days or weeks or even months on a ventilator is going to be left with scarring in the lung and something we call, to, to borrow a term from babies, chronic lung disease. In adults, we see this as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as COPD. Uh, we see it as asthma. We can see it as restricted pulmonary function. Very often, we see this in smokers. So I think probably what we are going to see are the residua typically of the inflammatory reaction. I think we will have a population of patients who have survived this who have limited pulmonary function. If it's been a neurologic problem, either from large strokes or mini strokes, we're going to see patients who have had brain tissue that's been damaged. We know that there's renal problems, so it's conceivable we could have patients with residual limited renal function. We know that the heart has been stressed. It could be that we see patients with compromised cardiac function. It's too early to know what we're going to see, but I, I do predict that there will be a, co a, a cohort of COVID-19 survivors who still have limited function in various organs, and we're going to have to learn how to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. Sumit, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think this is going to be a, an, an important issue going forward. Once we get past the, the, uh, the initial pandemic and we have this under control, is what, what is going to be the long-term fallout, right? And, and we're going to need to learn that in the lab, right? So the lab will tell us where to look, and then we'll start looking there. You know, it could be renal, it, it could be cardiac, it could be uh, brain issues, right? There's, um, and, and uh, I think it's important that we get a jump on this and, and before they actually start impacting the health of people, if we understand where to look, uh, we could jump in and try to get in some preventative treatments to mitigate some of these downstream chronic issues that people might face as a result of the infection. And, and I think that, uh, you know, my, my colleagues um, who are not virologists, but do are, are specialists in, in cardiac biology or renal biology or hepatic biology or, uh, and stem cell biology are all going to be playing an incredibly necessary role in understanding what are the long-term uh, impacts of infection will be, and, and uh, I think that this is going to be a, an area of intensive research for, for, for a good long time, uh, even for those of us who aren't, aren't virologists and uh, do this uh, as a day job. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're now going to switch gears a little bit. We had quite a number of questions that have come in from our audience, so, and some of these are specific to each of you. 
So uh, for Sumit, uh, remdesivir was recently approved by the FDA and President Trump hopes hydroxychloroquine, oh, I said that right, will be effective. <laughs> I wasn't sure, it doesn't always come out that way. Uh, yeah. did, you include, did you include these drugs in your screen? And if so, how did they perform? Uh, they both performed well. So uh, remdesivir is the most potent thing that we can find in the lab. Uh, hydroxychloroquine and a number of uh, chloroquine derivatives, which are related to hydroxychloroquine, uh, also did well. Um, I do have my reservations about hydroxychloroquine for a number of reasons. Uh, first uh, is that uh, we've seen hydroxychloroquine work well in the lab uh, for other viruses. This is not the first time hydroxychloroquine has been proposed as an antiviral. Uh, it's been proposed for Ebola, it's been proposed for flu, uh, a number of other viruses. The problem with uh, hydroxychloroquine has been for at least those other viruses, um, when you take it into patients, either as a therapeutic or a prophylactic, there was no benefit. So for some reason, uh, uh, the, the findings in the lab, uh, and there are a number of different hypotheses why, why this is, do not translate into either animal models or into people. Uh, the second uh, uh, reason I have a reservation about uh, hydroxychloroquine and people getting excited about it uh, is that the uh, the set of clinical trials that people have used to to really get excited about it were really what's called underpowered. It means that there weren't enough people in that trial um, to uh, to really be able to gain any sort of statistically significant conclusion. And so what typically happens in this in the clinical process is that you do these small cohort studies where you have a small number of people. If you see some benefit, then you go to a larger cohort, right? And then you do what's called a case control study where half the people get placebo, which means no drug or a sugar pill, and half the people get your drug. And you can then, uh, apples to apples, say, hey, yes, this drug worked compared to the people that didn't get the drug. So the study that got people excited uh, was not uh, um, a case control study. And I, I think that um, there was some funny math going on, let's put it that way, in the way that uh, that, that study was designed. So I think that, yes, I mean, I, I think it's good for people to get excited and have optimism, but we also need to let the process uh, stay its course, right? There is a well-trodden development process that we go through, right? Where we test these uh, compounds in animals, then we test them in people, then we test them in a bigger group of people to measure if we do have uh, significant outcomes that these, act these drugs actually do present a benefit to a large majority of the population. And as of now, the larger scale hydroxychloroquine studies have not borne out uh, the results from the, co uh, the smaller cohort studies. That's not unusual, but I think that's when we start uh, jumping up and down. Uh, so where I'm disappear, when that study came out, I was jumping up and down, okay? But that's the only study that I think has been sufficiently powered for us to really conclude that there's a there there. Uh, everything else is, is, is hope and hope is good, but it's not a clinical strategy, right? And so I would uh, encourage uh, your listeners to cheer things on and we all want things to succeed, but not really start going out and asking your doctor for things, uh, especially because you're taking them away from people who actually need it for other indications, uh, until and unless there's conclusive medical evidence that this does or does not work. And, and say that remdesivir actually does work. Um, is that going to be effective for everyone? It is not. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the signal on the remdesivir uh, uh, trial is that it shortened uh, hospital stays by a couple of days. So that was the end point they were looking at and then they were able to achieve that. But they were still people dying, there were still people going into the ICU. So as, as Evan mentioned, you're gonna need a, uh, a cocktail of therapies like we do for hepatitis C, like we do for HIV. So there's a couple of reasons you need a cocktail. Uh, one is to increase the uh, efficacy or the effectiveness of a drug. 
Uh, second, uh, because RNA viruses like to mutate. That's just kind of what they do. That's part, part of their job description. By having this ability to mutate uh, means that you have the ability to become resistant. And so what we found with other RNA viruses like HIV or, or hepatitis C is that if you throw a combination of at least three drugs at them, that boxes the virus into a corner where it can't mutate its way out of. And so they can't achieve resistance. The other thing it allows you to do is drop the doses uh, of each drug. So if there's any toxicity that's involved in those drugs, uh, then you can uh, uh, circumvent that by giving a cocktail of three drugs at lower doses. And so one of the things we're testing in the lab now is any are any of the things that we find have some sort of synergistic or additive effects with, with remdesivir. And the other point is, I again, uh, absolutely agree with, with, with Evan, uh, you were gonna need antivirals and anti-inflammatory. So things that treat the virus and things that treat our body's response to the virus. And so that's what I envision uh, uh, being able to help us control the virus. I think that what we want to do is have a treatment regimen that gets what's called the case uh, fatality rate, so the number of people that actually die from the virus, down to levels we see for influenza, which is not ideal. We're seeing every year anywhere from 30 to 50,000 Americans die from influenza, but that is something that uh, our hospital and our medical systems can handle, and it doesn't become this, this crisis uh, which affects every step uh, and every facet of, of our lives right now. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Evan, um, and you've already touched on this uh, quite a bit. I've heard that stopping the inflammation in the lungs that's called the cytokine storm will help cure the virus. Is this true? Well, as Sumit uh, mentioned, um, the virus triggers the inflammation. In this condition, as in many, many medical conditions, we're starting to learn it's, it's not so much the inciter that actually causes the damage or even causes the symptoms, it's the inflammatory reaction uh, that, that follows it. And for whatever reason, the inflammatory reaction here seems to be exuberant so that Probably, even if we cannot stop the virus, maybe what we need to do is figure out the best way to inhibit the inflammatory reaction. And again, this is where I'm hoping that we can help contribute to, uh, to Sumit's team and to Carl Ware's team, because we will have these mediators of inflammation, particularly in the lung, they're called macrophages, under our scrutiny and under our ability to manipulate them. And if indeed our arsenal of anti-inflammatory drugs are not adequate now, maybe we can help come up with those that are even better than those that exist to stop the inflammatory reaction in its tracks, looking at the cells in the lung that seem to be mediating this. Good. Thank you. Andrea, let me give you a, a nice parallel uh, anecdote uh, to that. I think that might help your, your, your listeners. Uh, so uh, drugs that uh, are used to treat flu, so there's Tamiflu, which everyone's heard of, and a new drug called uh, Biloxivir. Uh, these do a great job in, in, in blocking flu replication, but they have to be given within 48 to 72 hours of the onset of symptoms. Uh, so why is that? Do they not? Do they somehow stop working on the virus after 72 hours? No. It's just that after 72 hours, your body's response to the virus is inflammation that Evan was talking about. Uh, it's a different kind of inflammation than likely than with SARS-CoV-2, but it, it's, a, it's, it's still inflammation nonetheless, is the major driver of a negative outcome of disease. So yes, you have to control the virus, uh, but you also have to control your body's response to the virus. And, and, and this is the lesson that we've learned uh, with flu and, and with other viruses. So for people who have been exposed to the coronavirus and have antibodies, 
Um, but officials are telling us they don't know if these antibodies will be protective. Are there examples yeah. of other viruses where antibodies are not protective? Yeah, so I hate to say it, but uh, the other coronaviruses, uh, so <laughs> the common cold, uh, so coronaviruses, rhinoviruses, adenoviruses, we get these every year. Okay, so let's not I, listen. I, I don't want to. Ex, I don't want anyone to extrapolate that. Um, you know, we won't come up with uh, a vaccine or have protective antibodies against uh, um, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. But there are uh, uh, viruses that we continue to get over and over and over. Okay, uh, why is that? Some of that is uh, our immune system's fault. Either. We can't generate the right kind of antibodies, what are called neutralizing antibodies, which essentially block the function of the virus, right? You can uh, say, a lot, say if an antibody is a missile, uh, you need to hit the, hit the target. And if you miss the target, you could have antibodies, but they just don't do anything, okay? Or you may not generate high enough titers of antibodies. That means enough of the antibodies to actually make a difference, okay? Uh, the other thing is that you may generate those antibodies, but they're short-lived, right? Uh, you may have uh, some sort of immunity for months or maybe a year, okay? So none of this is known uh, of what, what our immune response to the virus is. We do generate antibodies. Uh, we don't know if they're gonna be protective and how across the board that's going to be, right? It could be different if, if Evan and I both get sick uh, I may not have antibodies that protect me, but uh, Evan might, right? So the, 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 the jury's still out on that. And so that's why uh, I think it's imprudent to assume that uh, because you've been sick and even if you get uh, a positive uh, uh, test on the antibodies, that just means that you've been exposed to the virus. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will have uh, protective antibodies. So. We will figure that out, and it's relatively straightforward to be able to figure that out. But again, these things take time to measure across a large swath of the population before we can make general conclusions as to what's going on uh, with the antibody response. How protective are they? How durable are they? Uh, and, and we're gonna ask the same questions about the vaccines when they, when they come out. Good, thank you. Um, this next question is for Evan. Um, it seems like children are immune to the virus, but the African American and Latin communities have been getting hit really hard by the virus. How can research help us understand why? I'm, I'm really glad you asked this question because um, it, it, it gives me an opportunity to talk about something that really surprised me, but then I realized that we could help uh, help answer. I was struck by the astounding disparity between the severity of the illness that various patients get, men worse than females, uh, African Americans and Latinos worse than Caucasians, maybe worse than Asians, older versus younger, and then certain disease states versus those without comorbidities. It, it, at first, it looked as if it was just an, you know, maybe a sampling error. And then it became very clear, this is a prominent phenomenon. And I also recognized that we could help answer this question. The lung organoids, I said, are made from stem cells. The stem cells are made from cells taken from actual patients. And we take these starting cells, whether it's skin or blood, and turn them into something called induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, this is something we've worked with for 10 years, and it's been used to model diseases because, because of the magic of stem cells, somehow these induced pluripotent stem cells, or called iPSCs, retain a lot of the disease characteristics right in them, so much so that we call them disease in a dish. So uh, cells that come from a patient with Parkinson's disease still retain Parkinson's disease. Same thing with Alzheimer's disease or various other kinds of diseases. Well, 
we've made the lung organoids from these iPSCs, which means that these are patient-specific lung organoids. And A, we will be able to see whether, in fact, the lung organoids from a male are different from a female, whether those from African American and Latinos are different from Caucasians, whether young are different from old. But in addition to that, um, what we can do is we always, as I showed in that earlier slide, start out at the very, very young. That's what turning these stem cells, uh, uh, turning these cells into stem cells does. And we watch development in a dish. And we will be able to see, are the young actually a little less vulnerable because they don't have certain kinds of receptors? But then as they get older, they start developing these receptors, and that's why age makes a difference. We've also learned, for example, that certain environmental toxins, certain perturbagens, vaping, tobacco, seem to accelerate the aging of these cells. And you can imagine that it, it's more than just vaping and tobacco. It could be the socioeconomic environment of certain groups that accelerate the aging and allow these receptors that the virus belongs onto to have a greater impact. We, are, we have the ability of changing the milieu. And this is something that actually has caught the interest of Ben Finley, who's in Christina Vori's lab, who is now interested in exposing these uh, organoids to these kind of environmental toxins to see whether it makes them more susceptible, maybe makes their inflammatory reaction even, even worse. But there's also a few lessons that we can get from this, just, uh, just apart from why we have this differential vulnerability. One, if there's something that's going on with the young cells that doesn't exist in the older cells, maybe we can somehow imbue that either as a drug or as, as some kind of biologic to older cells so that they act like younger cells. At worst, what we can make sure is that hopefully we will actually rule out inherent differences. But what we can do is use these to get to the right dose so that when we do get a killer drug, let's say, because of what Sumit and his colleagues are going to do, we can make sure, because we will have these mini lungs from many different groups, that either the dosing or the administration compensates for any kind of disparity so that once we do have a drug, it will apply to all comers. What we can also study, because we can manipulate, we can control this environment, is, is this really, if there are disparities, is it the presence or absence of a particular hormone? If there's a particular disease state, let's say it looks as if diabetics seem to be, for whatever reason, even more susceptible to this disease, we can study, is it a low insulin level or a high glucose in the environment that seems to make these cells more susceptible, and we can learn to compensate that. So I think what we can contribute is it is, in fact, that younger patients do seem to be more protected unless they've been exposed to vaping or tobacco. Well, let's understand that, that um, older seem to be more vulnerable because they have certain diseases. Maybe we can somehow have a, an extra kind of therapy for there where we block a particular kind of receptor. So I think that it's intriguing that there's a difference in, that there's this disparity. It's perturbing. It, it, and, but our job is to try to compensate for it so that when we do get the best cocktail of drugs, it will be useful for all comers, regardless of age, of comorbidities, of racial background, of gender. Thank you, Evan. That's incredibly interesting. And I can see where this has implications beyond, way beyond just just this virus. Um, so thank Thanks. you. Um, 
So we have time for one more question, um, and this is for either or both of you. Uh, I have a 21-year-old college student with a history of pulmonary abscess, pneumonia, and asthma, in addition to cerebral palsy. The University of Arizona has created their own COVID-19 testing and antibody testing. Would you consider letting him return to school in August based on what you currently know? Well, you know, it's very interesting. This is this kind of question that's posed is a question that's posed all the time to us. You know, it happens to be posed now for COVID-19, but there, particularly among children, there's a highly vulnerable population. These are those who have pre-existing lung diseases or neurologic diseases or things of that sort. And we protect those kids before they go out into the world. So um, if there are babies who have been on ventilators because they've been premature and have scarred over lungs, uh, before flu season comes, uh, we give them a protective vaccine or a protective drug because we know that they're highly vulnerable to that. If we have kids or even adults that seem to be susceptible to pneumonias, you know they get a vaccine against pneumococcal pneumonia. If they're gonna be an, and many, many vaccines are given to kids and particularly given to kids that, like the one, like the kid that was described, who, if they get sick, will have a, a horrible outcome. And because they often cannot clear pathogens from their airways or they're not moving a lot or they have restricted breathing, are likely to get this infection. So I would say you don't want to keep a kid like that from experiencing life, going to school, going to concerts. But what we need first is to make sure we have an adequate vaccine and adequate testing to be able to allow them to do that safely. And Sumit can comment on that. I think this disease is too new. This virus is too new to know whether we have it. However, once we do have it, I think then I would love to be able to protect these kids so that they can resume their normal life being mainstreamed into the community. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, without uh, talking about a specific uh, person, I think that those who are uh, on that list of people that are, are more susceptible or more vulnerable, uh, it's better to be uh, conservative over the next year to year and a half until the vaccine, the diagnostics come into place, right? So if uh, you know, if taking a year off from from college is an option, it may not be the worst option in the world right now, right? So uh, that's going to be an individual choice. Uh, I think you're going to need to the balance a number of different things, but there's too many unknowns out there. And and uh, again, if if or if or my kid, I would you know I would err on the side of of caution. Uh, because of the the unknowns that are that are out there, and and you know, it could be that this goes away in the summer and never comes back, right? I mean, I, that could be wishful thinking, but um, you know, and then uh, then then everything's good. But we don't know. We just don't know. And when you don't know, I think your your best stance is a is a more protective stance uh, to be, especially if you're if you're more vulnerable to this. Until we're able to have the, uh, the, the, the the medical necessities in place, both the treatment and the vaccine, to be able to help patients that are more uh, more, more susceptible and more vulnerable. Good. Um, <clears throat> so we we just have a couple more minutes left, and and there's a question that just popped up that I think uh, would be particularly interesting to the majority of our audience. So I'm going to ask that, and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, there are reports today from the Los Alamos National Laboratory that the virus is mutated and is more dangerous now. Is this true? Yeah, so that's work out of uh, Betty Korber's lab. Um, and so it looks like uh, the, the, what, what they found is that there's no, there are two dominant strains that are circulating and um, the, uh, the, the one that's come through Europe is actually more transmittable 
uh, than the, uh, the, the, the original uh, Asian strain. Um, so the work hasn't been peer reviewed, um, but uh, uh, you know, I know Betty's work and she's a, a, a top class scientist. So uh, I would, uh, I, I, you know, I, I would uh, uh, vouch for the conclusions in that, uh, in that, in that manuscript. Um, so what are the implications here? So it, it is, I mean, virus, as I mentioned, viruses mutate and our RNA viruses mutate. That's just, you know, part of their, well, they don't have DNA, they have RNA. So I'm gonna say it's part of their RNA um, is to mutate. Um, but, uh, um, you know, uh, the key, and it, and it has become more transmittable. You could imagine um, that there would be a selective pressure for a virus uh, mutation to enhance transmission between humans. So uh, the important uh, uh, aspect of this and the critical aspect of this is that it is it, it, the mutation was in a protein in which the vaccines are targeted, right? And so the question really is gonna be, um, is this gonna throw off vaccine development, right? It's, it's, it's not that, you know, I mean, all viruses mutate and, and we can handle that, right? And chances are it's not gonna mutate to be more deadly. It could mutate to be more transmittable, but this is a, a pretty transmittable virus. I think the virus is, you know, near its sweet spot uh, for, for a pandemic virus. But I think the key implication here is how is this going to impact a vaccine? And are we gonna need to change uh, the vaccine design mid-flight to accommodate these variations? And how much more uh, is this going to change? So fortunately, coronaviruses don't change that much uh, in comparison to a virus like HIV. Uh, but if it does continue to change, uh, you know, we are going to need to keep up and, and generate new viruses, now, a new vaccine. Now, is this something that we have to do once a year, once every couple of years? Who knows? Um, so it is concerning, um, but, uh, you know, it's probably uh, not going to be that impactful right now in, in our current uh, wave of, of infection, but uh, uh, need, needs to be something that we need to keep an eye on. And again, this comes down to surveillance and, and sequencing the virus and just making sure we have as much data and information uh, as possible that we can stay ahead of this virus uh, when, it, when it does try to change. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Evan, do you have any final thoughts? Yes, I, I, I guess what's come out of this hour is simply how attacking this new disease is a truly multidisciplinary activity. It requires and has gotten together everybody pulling their particular discipline into attacking this. Um, who would have thought a few months ago that a virologist like Sumit and a stem cell biologist like me would have been working so closely together, but whether Sumit likes it or not, we're locked at the hip probably for the next yeah. couple months. <laughs> well, and, probably other collaborators too, outside yeah. the organization. And yeah. of course, Absolutely. and it not only it requires other institutions, but even with our own institution, it's not just myself as a stem cell biologist and Sumit as a virologist, but also people like Carl Ware, who are experts in inflammation, and others like Ralph Bodmer, who's expert in the heart and aging and cell death. And we are now all pooling our resources and talking to each other. And, and I do, on a personal note, I have to say, how thankful I am to actually be at an institution like SBP that allows people of such diverse backgrounds to interact and collaborate so effortlessly and actually uh, kind, kind of catalyzes this kind of thing. I think, and I, I'm very optimistic that because we have uh, gotten onto this so quickly and that the, the the, the barriers are so limited that our institution and, and us are gonna make a, a very dramatic impact very quickly, maybe sooner than anybody else. Good, yeah. good to hear. I agree, Andrea, I think that uh, this pandemic and, and pandemics in, in general 
uh, need a need a Manhattan Project type type uh, infrastructure. And I think that Sanford Burnham and the greater San Diego area can really uh, nucleate an epicenter for this kind of activity going forward. Uh, it has happened here organically, uh, but I think that you know it's 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 up to us to keep keep this going, uh, not only to solve this year's pandemic, but next year's and and future pandemics uh, going forward. Yep, I agree, and uh, I think we're. Uh, we're doing the right work here and as a community, and I just want to thank you both so much again for taking the time to be with us today, and thank you to everyone for attending today. Um, we hope that you found this informative, um, and to all of our supporters, I just want to send out a special thank you. Um, without you, we would not be able to move this critical research forward. Um, so if you would like to provide philanthropic support to Dr. Shonda and Dr. Snyder's efforts, uh, you can do so on the Support Us tab on our website at svpdiscovery.org. Um, we'll keep you posted on any future Insight virtual events and any progress with our COVID research. And if you have friends or family that were not able to attend today's webcast, it was recorded and will be on our site at svpdiscovery.org backslash insights. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today, and have a great afternoon.